All right, one more, one more quick example on the board here, uh, just to wrap up chapter 16. More, more rolling wheels without slip. And the idea here is I've got, a, I've got a demo for you. So let's assume that we have a wheel. And the wheel has an inner hub. And so we've got a, an outer wheel radius, the R0, which is 0.1 meters. And then there's also an inner radius, Ri, of the hub. Uh, and that's at 0.08 meters. And the idea is there's going to be a rope that wraps around the hub, kind of like this. Right? And the question is, when I pull it, so if I take this hub and I pull it, when I pull on the string, which way will the wheel roll? And what are its accelerations at various points? So how many people think, if I pull on the string, right, how many people think it will roll this way towards me? Right, hands up. How many people think it will roll away from me? Be shy. OK. So we're going we're gonna to solve this, all right, and we're going we're gonna to evaluate and assess whether or not your intuition is correct or not correct based on that. OK. And then we'll do all the calculations for all the accelerations in, in a second. So first things first, let's just figure out the direction of where the wheel might roll. OK. So rolling without slip. I'll give you that piece of information again. Okay? And right away, because it's rolling without slip, we know a few things. We know velocity at point C must be 0. And we also know that we can call this, at that particular instant, the IC, the instantaneous center for zero velocity. And one other thing, I can also tell you that the acceleration of C that's tangential to the part of the wheel, that also must be 0. right? So why do I know this? This is the same as when we did the conveyor belt problems. right? The, the direction that is tangent to the wheel at the point where it is in contact with whatever surface it is, it's going to have the tangential acceleration of that surface. So ground not moving is the reason why your AC of t is equal to 0. Okay, So two immediate pieces of information. And so what we want to do is, if we want to figure out which direction this wheel is going to roll, first things first, we should figure out velocity of d and velocity of a, and also the omega. So velocity of d I've given to you. It's 0.075 i meter per second. And note that I've purposely flipped your xy coordinate system to look like a mirror version of what we've been doing. So think about it this way. The best way to imagine this, if you can, is either ignore positive and negative x completely and just make sure that you intuitively know directions, which we are going to do. Or you got to picture it kind of like you're, you're on the other side of the board now. right? So if you picture it from this way, then your y, x is going to face you the, the, the way that you normally see it. Right? So just a little twist to see if we can reorient our directions a little bit. Okay? So here's the first thing. We note the following. I've given you the velocity for d. And d is the velocity of the point of the rope that I just pulled on. If I pull at that velocity, then vb has to also be the same. So the velocity of that point of the hub must also be 0.0. 0.075 meter per second. And based on that, now I can find my omega because I can figure out uh, that omega must be the, the, the equation where I use the difference between two velocities. So I could do the following. I could say absolute value where I take the magnitudes of VB minus VC and divide that specifically by the distance between B and C. So we get the following. It should be 0 0.075 minus 0 divided by the distance. So the distance is the difference between the radii, 0 0.02 meters. And so omega is equal to 3.75 radians per second. And the wheel must be going 
to the left. Okay? So for all those who thought that the wheel was going to roll to the left, absolutely. And here's the reason, right? We've already drawn these diagrams before, but let me draw it again. Here was the point VC where there was no velocity. And now I've indicated that the rope right here is pulling to the left. And I've indicated that the velocity must be a little bit positive. Well, guess what? If this is 0 and this is a little bit of the velocity to the left, shouldn't surprise you that the wheel is going to roll this way, and you're going to get one of these velocity profiles that looks like this. Okay? Basically, the whole thing is tipping forward that way, and you've got increasing velocities the further you are away from that instantaneous center. Okay? So the, uh, the wheel rolls left. OK, next things. Once we figure out omega, you need accelerations is what we're after. So we need to figure out our, our alpha. So how do we figure out our alpha? Our alpha, same calculation. It'd be really nice if we could write something similar to this. We realize that we have to do it only with the tangential components. So it should be something like this, AB of t minus AC of t divided by distance from b to c. Right? And so again, very, very similar to that conveyor belt problem. We know that this one must be the acceleration of whatever's tugging on it, whatever it's in contact with, so the rope. So it must be the value that I gave you for AD. It must be 0 0.4 minus ACT, which is the ground, that's 0. And then again, 0 0.02 is the difference between the radii. So your alpha is 20 radians per second squared. Again, you're ba you're, you should be determining your directions just from the observations alone, right? Like basically, which direction is it tipping in? So if I told you that the, that the AD, the acceleration of the rope, is that I am pulling on the rope and it is accelerating to the left, then I'm going to get a diagram that looks like this again, right? It should be this is 0, that's going to the left, so the whole thing tips this way. Right? In other, in other words, as you, keep, as you draw these diagrams, so let's say you have a linkage bar, and you've been given certain information, and I say, well, my, a, my AT is this way for that end of the rod, and AT is this way for this end of the rod. Look what that means. It means that the link has to be rotating this way, right? That's just by observation. It's just the arrows are telling you it is accelerating that way. OK? OK, so we've, uh, we've solved alpha, and we've solved omega, and now we have to figure out values for AA, AB, and AC. AC is the one where we basically know, know pretty much a lot of the information, right? We know the tangential, and we know the total acceleration. So I just have to figure out what all the other accelerations are relative to AC. OK, so your natural, your natural Logical choice is if I want AA, obviously do the following, right? AC plus AA with respect to C. That seems pretty logical. And I'm going to break up this relative motion into my typical normal and tangential components. That's pretty obvious, right? OK, so here's what it's going to look like. I'm going to draw my RA with respect to C. So here's my diagram. My RA with respect to C is going to be right here, right? 
There's my RA with respect to C. OK, so if that's RA with respect to C, then what do we know about the other components of the acceleration? We know that based on this point, which I've used as my instantaneous center, I know the following. The acceleration that's tangential must be in this direction. So this must be my AACT. There. And then the AACN is always opposite my radial vector. So it should always be like this. This one going straight down. This one is my AACN. And we've always been doing that. Nothing has changed. Okay. So now what I know is basically because of the way that I've drawn the point of contact with the road to the center of the wheel, you should be very confident that this t is in the x direction, in the i direction, and this n has to be in the downward j component. So what I can do is the following. I can write here, this guy should be to the left, which is my positive i, and I know its value. Its value must be alpha r o, right? Or actually, no, r a c. That's my, which is the same as RO, but I'm going to be very, very careful with my notation here. So we know the magnitude, right, alpha R, and we know the direction just based on the way I drew the diagram. Then I'm going to do this. This is my, my AACN. It's going to be downward J, so it has to be plus a negative omega squared RAC. That's the magnitude, as always, and it was negative J. Negative J. OK? So I want to I wanna, I wanna now draw your attention. I'm going to fill in the two blanks here on the left. Notice that I have an I component and a J component that are non-zero, clearly non-zero. And I'm going to ask you a quick question. For AA, the center of the wheel, what do we know about its direction? It's the axis of your wheel, right? And we know that it can't move in the j direction, so it has to be straight line horizontal. Which means even though if we don't know the value of this, even though we don't know the value, it must be AAI only. Everyone clear on that? OK. And if this is in the I component, and this is an I and a J. This AC value, even though we don't know it, guess what? It must be only in the J component. Why? Because I told you that ACT was 0. So this one, ACT is 0, ground not moving horizontally, right? Ground not moving. So that's the, that's the only way in which this equation would balance is if we took this into account, the ground's not moving, tangential acceleration zero, and look at all these directions. This is basically telling you something about rolling wheels, specifically, that there is a general answer for all rolling wheels, and that is the following. AA, if I look at the way the eyes must balance, AA is always alpha R A C, alpha R naught. Okay? So always true for rolling wheels without slip. In other words, it pins the contact point as that instantaneous center of zero velocity where it doesn't move. And then when you look at the way the directions of all these arrows and vectors go, basically you can always solve that center point of a perfectly circular wheel. It's got to be your alpha times the radius of that wheel. 
So that's always, always true. And then if I do my other balance for my, for my j's, you'll note the following. ac minus omega squared r is equal to 0. So ac would be omega squared rac, and in fact must be omega squared r naught. And so what does that mean? It means that exactly like the conveyor belt problem, you'll remember that as the wheel is spinning, it has an omega, like this, and the omega squared r is a normal acceleration that points upward towards the center of the wheel. So that's why we have those two equations. OK? Is that? Does that make sense? OK, so, so with those general results now, I can give you the solution for all three of the points that we were looking at. I can then say that AA for my problem, so for this problem, so AA would be just alpha times R naught. So it would be 20 radians per second squared r naught is 0.1 meter, so 2 meter per second squared in the positive i. So that's that way. And then I'll give you ac. ac is this, so it would be my 3.75 squared, 0.1. One point four one J. That okay, and then I'll give you A B. So A B is just the point that's on the hub. So now you, can, now you can use whichever point you like. In my notes, I used AA as my reference. And so that means that I could use that solution right there. It's going to be a 2i and then plus everything else. So this will be b with respect to a. So b with respect to a is just downward. And then that should give me a. 20 radian per second squared times the distance of the inner radius, 0 0.08. And that's going to be negative i. And then plus 3.75 squared. 0 0.08. Okay, so that's your solution. And then just to prove my point here, we'll just do a little poll. So the idea is, I think, I think for the people who guess the other way, I think our intuition is that sometimes you, you like to pull this way, right? So you pull this way, and it rolls the other way. But in this, particular, in this particular demo, so you're doing that, right? In this particular demo, it's a, it's a string that's straight across. And that matters a whole lot, because if it's straight across, and this point is your instantaneous center of zero velocity, you pull on this, and there's no way that the wheel would go the other way because all of your force and all of your, your velo the velocity that you've applied to the rope is clearly tipping the wheel towards the direction of the rope, okay? To the tug of the rope. So there's really no way that it would go the other way, right? Okay. Okay, any, any questions on that? Why is AC positive? This one right here? 
Okay, so it's because of your, uh, think, think about it this way, your wheel is, uh, remember, partly translating, partly rotating, right? So all general plane motion, a rotating part and a translating part. If you eliminate the translating part, so let's assume that the object already shifted, but is also rotating, the normal acceleration is always going to be in the direction to the concave direction of your curvilinear path. So this object did this, right? And then the path is that this, this basically this point wanted to go there. And then the, the point was the normal acceleration is upward, right? So all of those things line up. OK, so bottom line, remember this. You're going to be asked various questions from now on. You're going to be told, wheel, rolling without slip. Then you know that you have to deal with something like this, OK? You also know that. Anytime you have a hub, make sure that you take this information and use it at your disposal. It's got to be a velocity, for instance, that is halfway between this and this, right? That's logical. And then the next thing is, we can also ask you questions where it is a rolling wheel with slip. So what happens if a wheel does slip and things have to change, right? So we will, we will ask those questions. And I'll show you some examples on how to do that. But just remember that that wording is going to matter a great deal for when you do your analysis. Okay? All right. So I'm going to jump ahead now. And that, that concludes chapter 16. And I'm going to start chapter 17. Let's start it over here. OK. OK, so. Just to recap what a rigid body is all about, we know that this is obviously a system of particles that's rigidly stuck together. And I know I haven't drawn many of these types of theoretical diagrams yet. But let's do, let's do the following. right? I'm going to draw my irregularly shaped object, like I have in some cases. But I want to I I start defining certain things um, for you that give you this idea that this object now has size and shape and all that matters. And so the way that we must think about this is start with everything that I taught you when we did particles. And we're now going to sum everything up across those particles. So what I mean by that is if I had a particle somewhere in this irregularly shaped object, I would be able to define the location of that one particle with a position vector ri. And not only that, but this particle is going to have maybe a certain velocity. And that velocity is going to be like a vi. And it might be moving off in some direction, right? And the cool thing is, because this is a rigid body, the particles that are right beside it are going to move in a way that is related to this vi, which we will get to in a second. Now, not only is this happening, but from the chapter 17 perspective, we are now dealing with kinetics. Right? Which means that it's not just the position, velocity, and acceleration. We should now be thinking about forces. So the forces on this particle are such that there's going to be external forces, like things that are being pushed onto that object or pulling on the object. And we call these external forces like a capital Fi. Okay? These are our external forces. Things like gravity, that would be like an external force on that one little particle. Okay. And then inside where the particle is buried close to all the other molecules, it's even got a tiny little f. This is an internal force. 
So internal forces, because of the fact that it is being neighbored and touched by other molecules in the rigid body. So we've got a diagram here. Here's my x and y. And in fact, we're going to ignore the third dimension. So I'm going to now define for you how to deal with the rigid body's shape and size. OK, so first things first. One more, one more thing, the, 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 the particle has a mass mi as well, right? OK, so the particle has a mass mi positioned ri away from origin o, all these forces and velocities. So the first thing is total mass. For total mass of the rigid body, I've been just giving you this, just like an m. m is whatever, right? m is 2 kilograms for the whole wheel. But what that really means is mathematically, you're going to sum all of the individual particles that make up that object across all objects i. OK, so that's pretty, that's pretty obvious. Next thing, center of mass. OK, so how do we define center of mass? How we define that is, you're basically trying to look at all the different masses on the rigid body, and you're trying to find the point where masses on the left of that point, to the right of that point, above that point, below that point, they all balance. Okay? It is the point where if you weighted each little mass mi, its distance away from the center of mass, and you balanced it, it would have to be like at equilibrium if you tried to balance it. OK, so how do you write that mathematically? You say the following. You say, if I took a little bit of mi, every single particle, and I multiplied it by ri, the vector, so that there's a distance associated with it, and you summed all of that across i, okay, it must be equal to the total mass m multiplied by that point that we're interested in, rg. Okay? So if that's the equation, then you rearrange, and it therefore must be sum i m i r i divided by r g. Oops, divided by m. OK? And not only that, but you can obviously break this up. It's a vector, so we actually clearly have a center of mass that locates both the x and y, both the x and y uh, positions. So xg would be like if you took a sum of all the i's, m i x i divided by m, and then y g is sum i m i y i over m. So that's the only way in which you can ensure that the left side of my object and the right side are balanced, right? So what do I mean by that? Let's say I have this particular irregularly shaped object, right? And I want to find the center of mass of this object experimentally. How can I actually locate it? It's, it's really, really oddly shaped. And so any thoughts, any thoughts on how I might be able to balance this and find its center of mass? Right? So I'll do one, one point for you. Right? The first point is if I just hung it on one particular point, this object is going to swing to its equilibrium position. Right? And so what do I know about this particular point now for this really, really regularly shaped object? I know that along this vertical line, half of the mass was actually on this side, and half of the mass was on the other side, right? roughly speaking. right? So that's why it would balance. So I can actually draw a line, a dotted line, straight down this path, and I would know that my RG has to lie on that line. So the next thing you do is you pick another point, right? pick another point, and you do the same thing. And you draw a vertical line through that, and then the RG has to be the intersection of these two points. So that's kind of like a physical way for you to just kind of capture the idea of what a center of mass really, really means. It's that point where no matter where you, no matter how you rotate your mass, you stick a point through it, 
And it's almost like the weight on the left and the weight on the right, it just tips the object so that it's really, really balanced. Okay? And that's reflected in these equations over here. Okay, so what else do we know? I can tell you the following. So I can also show you that for each, like if I now do the dynamic side of things, so if I do kinetics, okay, now let's talk about the forces that are involved on all of the individual particles that make up this rigid body. If I did that, here's what you would know. You would see that for a single mi, any given mi, Newton's second law has to apply. So it would be the idea of me taking my total external force, capital Fi, all the internal forces, little fi, and saying that that must be, that must be like that. That must be an mi times an ai. And I'm going to make all of these vectors, right? OK? There's no, there's no disputing that. So what I then do is for the whole system, You're going to sum across all i. So it would be the equivalent of me adding up all external forces, adding up all internal forces, and making that equal to the sum of all m i a i, all the little bits of acceleration. Right? Okay? So from here, Here's what we know. If I take this sum of all the internal forces, guess what happens? All internal forces must be self-canceling, right? They must cancel each other out because if one particle feels an internal force from its neighbors, right, it basically has this Newton's third law of reaction forces that must be equal and opposite. So all those terms are gone. I'm left with this term and this term. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out how exactly this relates to my center of mass. So if the sum of all my external forces are sum of m i a i, here's what I know. I know the following. Sum of m r m i r i, like that. is equal to mrg by definition. I'm going to now take derivatives. Take two derivatives. OK? What happens when you take two derivatives? This r becomes a dr dt, so a velocity. And those m stay constant. And you take a second derivative, this becomes a dv dt, which is an a. So it would be the equivalent of m i a i for all the little bits, add them up together, and it would be m a g, the acceleration specifically at the center of mass. So this is a really useful result. It basically means the following. Add up all of the forces that are external to a rigid body, and it must be equal to the acceleration at the center of mass times its total mass. It means you can start to forget about all the little masses that are stuck together, and you just have to worry about the total mass and this one very important location, g. Is that clear? OK. And I'll say this. In fact, everything that we did in the kinematic section for a particle or kin uh, in, 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 the, in the kinetic section for particle. Everything that we did with particles where we ignored rotation was basically this implied assumption that we were dealing with a car going on a street, right, turning, turning into a certain curvature, a radius of curvature on the highway. The reason why all of that worked was because we just treated all the things at the center of mass of that vehicle, right? So we did, basically did this and applied it to the center of mass and ignored rotation. OK, so that's the, that's the critical result. And then I want to show you what that means for us 
moving forward. Given that we are now dealing with the actual rigid body where size and shape matters, we cannot just simply use f is equal to ma because the thing is going to now rotate. So for rigid bodies, sum of f equal to mag only takes care of translation. And so the new equation that we're going to introduce for you is an equation for rotation. And that equation is the following. Sum of moments about g is equal to ig alpha. Okay. OK, so I will have to explain where that comes from. Probably the beginning of next week. I'm going to see if I can, in the next 10 minutes, just sort of paint the picture for you here. I'm going to, I'm going to do a quick summary of basically equations you need to solve for these rigid body kinetics problems. To solve 2D rigid body kinetic problems. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. You're going to take this f is equal to mag, and you're going to write it in its component form. So in other words, you're going to do an x, you're going to do a y, those are your components, right? Or in other coordinates, right? And now we're going to add this third equation, and the third equation is going to be a sum of moments, i, g, alpha. And I'm going to just leave it as a scalar equation because for 2D, always rotating in k, right? It's always rotating in that k unit vector like we've been doing all along. So I'm going to leave this as a scalar. This set of three equations now becomes the three that you need to solve the motion of a rigid body, OK? I saw a hand go up. Yeah. What's i? Yeah, I'm going to get to that in a second. OK, so so far. Here's what I've written for you, and I'm going to now explain to you what actually is going on. OK, so in this equation, OK, this is all external moments about the center of mass g. Okay. And this is going to be equal to an IG. The IG is what is called the mass moment of inertia. And this alpha, angular acceleration. OK, so just to give you a prelude, all of next class, I'll be talking about this very important property of this rigid body IG, the mass moment of inertia. But for now, I want you to see the parallels in this. OK? I want you to think, I want you to think very carefully about how you understand Newton's second law. So Newton's second law and the way we view mass Everything's happening in these straight in, 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 in lines, right? Okay, and so you're you're moving and accelerating either in a curvilinear path or a straight line path. But here's the deal. Mass has always been linked to Newton's first law, which is inertia. It means that if a mass has a certain motion, so it's moving ahead, if it has a certain velocity, it will tend to want to continue moving 
unless you apply a force. So look at, look at the way this mass is. The mass is, is, is basically like this, with the acceleration. Let me, let me flip the equation around and do this, right? What does this say? This basically says, look, if I have a certain mass, right, this total external force, depending on the value of that, the bigger this mass, the slower the acceleration. So the way we view mass as, a, as inertia is the fact that it is the quantity that resists linear acceleration. Okay? The larger the mass, the more it is resistant to the forces that want to give it acceleration. Right? And that's exactly what we are trying to show you here with this equally simple equation. If I rearrange it, you see the parallels. I'm going to put my angular acceleration on the left. I'm going to put my sum of moments on the top and my IG on the bottom. And what do you have? You have the fact that if you do a lot of twisting motions, so you're torquing an object, you're rotating it, that's all the stuff on the, in the numerator, right? <coughs> IG is a property of the rigid body that tells you how resistant it is to these moments. Okay? So just like the bigger the mass, the smaller your linear acceleration for the same amount of force, the bigger your mass moment of inertia IG, the less it's going to accelerate when it rotates. Okay? So you apply a certain amount of moment, right? And if it's got a huge IG, then its angular acceleration is going to be smaller. Okay? Okay, so that's the picture that I'm trying to paint for you. I'm going to get into a lot of detail for this IG. I just want you to see this. Okay? And I'm going to do one more thing in the last five minutes, right? Let me, let me just also clarify one other thing for you. Right? How, do we, how do we get moments on a rigid body? Right? So here's, I'll draw you two pictures. Right? So let me, let me put my center of mass G there. Okay? So why was it that we were allowed to ignore size, shape, and rotations when we were doing particles? There's one little trick here that you can, you can assume. You can basically assume that when you're applying forces, okay, here's my mg force, right? Maybe I'm pulling on it. So this is my F1, there's my F2, here's an F3, right? The way you view this is maybe all those forces were just going right through the center of mass. It's just going right through like that. Okay? There's a term for this. These are called concurrent forces. Okay? And concurrent forces are nice because if they pass through the center of mass G, basically what happens? They don't cause rotation, right? They don't twist the object. And the sum of all of these external forces would be forced to just simply translate the rigid body. So the thing can't rotate, right? Guess what happens in now our 2D rigid body kinetics? I'm going to start doing the following. I'm going to put a force over here that's going to have a tendency to tip the rigid body. So this is my F1. This might be my F2. I'm still going to have an MG that doesn't do any rotation. And then not only that, I'm going to tell you about very specific moments that I apply, right? So I'm going to twist it with a certain torque. And I'm going to push it this way, and it's going to cause the rigid body to have an omega and an alpha. And so these types of forces are called non-concurrent forces, right? And these non-concurrent forces are the source behind why my, my object is going to have an omega and have an alpha. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? Hopefully? Yeah. Go over concurrent forces? Okay, so I'm just basically telling you, like, in, in some cases, if it happens to be really like a handy problem where your forces, the line, so these are called lines of action, right? A force is basically, it's a vector. If you trace that vector, and the line that it follows cuts straight through the center of mass, how is it going to rotate this object? It can't, because it has no moment arm around G. So because it has no moment arm around G, 
this force won't rotate the object. This force also passing through G won't rotate the object. These concurrent forces will leave the object in just perfect translation. Okay? It's only when I do things like this, right? I purposely twist it with a wrench. I apply a force and I, and I have a moment arm. So if I, draw the, if I draw the line of action of my F2 here in this diagram, what happens? I can actually draw the perpendicular line that connects the G to that line of action, and that's my moment arm. So clearly this F is going to knock this object and rotate it. Okay? So that's what I mean when I do this. Every time we apply a force or we apply a moment, we're going to include that into the left-hand side here as an external moment. And we're going to ask ourselves, what is the IG of the rigid body? And how does it move? What is its alpha? Okay? Okay, so that's it. I'll start that on Monday. <laughs>